Good morning, and welcome to worship at First Church. It is good to be together again for the 9 a.m. service, the morning prayer and Holy Communion service. This is the seventh Sunday of Pentecost, after Pentecost, and we're glad that we are back together again for worship. We hope that you are taking care of yourself as you join us today, and please know that there are ways to participate. You are obviously watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live so that you can follow along. The bulletin can be found at our website, www.first-church.org. I'm glad to be joined today by Reverend Emily Corzine and by Mr. Mark Williams and Mr. Kevin Jones. I am Tim Ahrens. It is good to be together in worship. Please join me in the opening sentences. This is the day which God has made. O oh God, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. join together in the psalm of the day, Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me. We pass the peace of Christ together today as we are across this space and time. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And peace to you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so I have a question for you. Do you like surprises? I love surprises. Oh, wait a minute, I should say, I love good surprises. Did you know this, that there are different, different kinds of surprises? Yeah, there's great surprises, like a birthday party or something like that, right? Or a surprise vacation. Those are great surprises. The not so great surprises are like when you go outside to ride your bike and you realize you got a flat tire. Or you um, think you're going to go out and play in the backyard and you and you discover that it's raining. Those are surprises. They're not so good, right? And, you know, as you get older, you're going to find a lot of those different surprises that are not always the good. 
So the reason why I'm talking about surprises is because in our gospel lesson today, the workers in the field, they had planted this grain, and they were like, oh, surprised because when it grew, there were weeds there. They didn't plant weeds, so that was a surprise. So what they did, well, okay, we got this, so they decided <clears throat> on a plan. They decided on a plan. But before they did the plan, they went to talk to their boss to make sure that their plan was okay because they were going to go into the field and pull out the weeds. Okay? But the boss said, no, do not pull the weeds because when you go in there, you're going to damage the grain. That was the second surprise, right? Because they thought they had it all worked out. So surprises can be kind of funky at times. The point here is that there are a lot of things that we plan and we get surprised about. Some are good, some are not so good. However, we always need to check with the boss as we move forward in these surprises. And that boss to us is God. We need to check in with God. So when we get surprised about things, we're like, oh, what do I do now? God will lead us and guide us in those surprises. So I hope the next time you have a happy surprise, you're good. And when you have a surprise that's not so good, check in with the boss. Check in with God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for surprises. Thank you for making us aware of things around us that we just didn't see was there. Help us and guide us in our surprises and remind us each and every day when we are surprised to turn to you, listen to you. In your son's precious name, amen. See you next week. first reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis in chapter 28, beginning in verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set upon the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south and all of the families of the earth shall be blessed by you and your offspring. Know that I am with you, and that I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the place Bethel. By the name of the city was Luz at the first. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And as slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send angels angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open our hearts and minds, O God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. As your word is proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you have for us this day. Amen. I want to share a story with you this morning, one given to me by a clergy colleague in town. A few years ago, an idea began gaining popularity and traction in cities around the United States, and even more broadly, across the world. So I'd like to introduce to you an idea, guerrilla gardening. 
Clearly, I don't mean guerrilla as in lowland guerrilla, but guerrilla as in guerrilla warfare. Of course, a movement called guerrilla gardening has nothing to do with war. Guerrilla gardening is this movement of people who notice the abandoned pieces of land in their community that have been neglected by their owners. They notice them day after day falling into further decay until they decide through the adverse, subversive act of gardening that they will, make, uh, they will act to make these places beautiful. They find forgotten places, sometimes as small as a patch of dirt on a street corner and sometimes as big as an abandoned lot. Places overlooked and ugly. Places that we would all agree are empty of life and seem completely worthless. Places that are dead, and they revive them. They come under the cover of darkness, scattering fresh soil and flower seeds, seeds to, that grow color and fragrance and beauty. They come when no one is watching, planting vegetables and fruit for people in the community to share. They find abandoned and forgotten pieces of God's creation, and they take part in transforming them, turning them into places that are full of life, turning them into places that add value and beauty to their surroundings. These guerrilla gardeners have taken renewal as their calling, and in their eyes, there is no place that is too far removed from redemption. In a weedy lot, surrounded by a chain link fence, they see a blank canvas where beauty can grow. In a forgotten patch of dirt, a place that is designed to be overlooked, they see hope and opportunity. In spaces that other people drive by, they see a place with that with some work and love can have meaning and can have purpose. A place that can produce food to share. A place that can make their community a better place and in some ways, our world a better place too. One of the most important tools in the, belt, in the tool belt of a guerrilla gardener is this thing called a seed bomb. Now there are little small portable dried up globs of dirt and clay and fertilizer that have seeds mixed into it. They are tiny capsules that have everything they need to help the seed grow wherever it lands. It's designed to be throwable, to toss over a fence or even out a car window, so that wherever the seed bomb is thrown, even on concrete, once it rains, the seed will germinate and grow. So wherever a gorilla gardener may find themselves as they go about their day, if they happen to discover a place that looks abandoned or neglected, they're equipped. All they have to do is throw the seed bomb and a small act of gardening rebellion. They know that this neglected place will be just a little more beautiful, a little bit more redeemed, a little more holy, perhaps a little bit more loved. I want to tell you another story about Ron Finley, a guerrilla gardener in urban South Central Los Angeles. I heard him on a Tim talk a few years ago. He's an artist. He grows his art. Gardening is his graffiti. He beautifies lawns and parkways and little patches of yard between the sidewalk and the street. You know, the, the piece of land that the city says they own, but you're supposed to take care of it. That little piece of yard. That soil becomes his piece of art. Trees become the embellishment to that cloth. You'd be amazed at what can happen when you let that soil be your canvas, he says. Ron shares a lot of stories about the impact this garden has on families in his community, but ultimately says this is what happens. He says, I've witnessed my garden become a tool for education, a tool for the transformation of my neighborhood, to change the community. You have to change the composition of the soil. And we are the soil, unquote. So gardening is an act of defiance in the community. When the city may be used to issuing violations of uncared for land, gardening is an act of defiance. 
In this series of parables that we've heard, Jesus is having a mediocre crop, certainly mixed results among the people who are hearing his words. When Jesus speaks in parables, he calls his followers to change their mind, to the joy of seeing themselves in God's kingdom. So we hear what the kingdom of God can be like, that God has been waiting a long time. Like Ron Finley, we have every opportunity to see not just what the world is like in the past or what it might be in the future, but what it is like right now. God's kingdom being present in the world is which the field where God's people are planted, planted to live and work and pray and suffer and struggle and serve and witness and finally, in God's good time, to surrender our lives to God. So people of God, here we wait, knowing that Jesus has sown the church among the nations as a witness to God's patient hope for the world. But it's not uncommon for the church, the people of God, to weed those who have been planted by God. Maybe we've done our share of weeding, shaming, disregarding, separating. Maybe that's something we have to repent for in order to see the world in a different way. And we hear Jesus counsel that more than mere tolerance is needed in this case. The parable compels us to recognize and rejoice in this goodness that God offers in others, a goodness that is freely given without distinction. Jesus is talking about changing the composition of the soil of this world, about taking people and places that are dead and dying and bringing them back to life. As people who have been redeemed, we are called to let this change everything about who we are and how we live. As people who have learned Christ's ways, we are called to start living them out. Have you noticed maybe the brokenness or the division in our community? Why don't we hurl some forgiveness or some love over those fences like a seed bomb? Sow some of that gratitude into the rocky soil and know that all this work, all this daily effort, is a tiny bit of revolution. Amen. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Be still. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. Be Gracious God, as we gather this day, we give thanks to you for Jesus Christ, who died but is risen. We give you thanks for his presence among us. Because he lives, we look to you for eternal life, knowing that nothing past, present, or yet to come can separate us from your great love known to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. This day we offer our prayers on behalf of this church, this community, and your world, our world. We pray today for individual needs, and we invite all who are joining us to pray at home or where you are. We pray for concerns and thanksgivings of this congregation, for members, 
for families, for friends who are listed in our Depart to Serve and whom we hold in our hearts in prayer. As directed, we invite all of us, all of you, to join in silently or where you are aloud and lift your hand, hold your hand open as you raise your concern, your need, your thanksgiving. Gracious God, we are so thankful for our children, and we give you thanks that they show us a way to uh, find the seeds growing in the life around us in these days. We thank you for blessing us with them. We thank you for doctors and nurses and all emerging and caregiving people in this community who um, look after the needs of everyone in so many amazing ways. May we be part of the transformation of life and the bringing of hope in this day as they show us by example. We lift up this day Mary Kay Beale and John Carter in the loss of Mary Kay's cousin Paul to COVID-19. And for the 10 million and more who have tested positive with COVID-19 in the world and more than half a million who have died across the globe. And for those in our own country as there are rising numbers of COVID spreading. We lift up prayers that are in our hearts. Almighty God, in Christ you have embraced all of life through the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. We ask that you pour out your grace upon us that we may love all of life as you have loved us. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Eternal God, you created us and create us by your power and redeem us by your love. Guide and strengthen us by your spirit that we may give ourselves in love and service to one another and to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our time of stewardship is always a time to say thank you and to return thanks for all the gifts that God has given us. Uh, we are grateful for all of you who are generously supporting the mission and ministry of First Church week in and week out during these days. We always know that in the summertime we drift away. So we thank you for anchoring in and for continuing your glorious support of the work of the church. Today we have a special mission offering. This mission offering is for CRIS, which is the Community Refugee and Immigration Services here in Central Ohio. CRIS is an independent agency. It's a not-for-profit agency, and it serves the refugees and asylum seekers and immigrants who are living here in Central Ohio. First Congregational Church was a part of founding CRIS so many years ago, and we continue to support CRIS over the years, and we do it by relationship building. I don't know how many times I've heard the word million over the last couple of years, and it's always in relation to one young man. Million is one of the refugees that we're serving, and he is growing and prospering, sort of like the gorilla bomb. He's planted in our land, and he is growing and prospering. So for Million, for his family, for all the children, and for those who we do not see, let us be generous in supporting this important uh, work to welcome the stranger and support the ones that we do not know who want to be new Americans. Thank you.
Just recently, First Congregational Church lost one of its true lights, Clara Harsh. Clara was a part of our church for 50 years. She and her husband raised their children here. She, she helped make the costumes, Mark, that our pageant has each year at Christmas from fabric she picked by hand from the mills in North Carolina. But I want to tell a story about her related to Holy Communion. It was the early 1960s. She was one of the first female deacons of First Congregational Church. And our pastor at the time, the Reverend Dr. Chalmers Coe, came to the diaconate board and said, let's try to expand the number of days for Sunday worship that we receive communion at First Church. At that time, it was only at Easter and Christmas, two times a year. And here we stand at the 9 a.m. service where we celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday. In the meeting, there was a lot of resistance. And people said, we can't have communion that often. And Clara raised her hand and she said, perhaps receiving the body and blood of Christ more often could help us. It can help us. It is here to help us all the time. It is actually never intended to hurt, only to help, to help us remember such love as this, to help us spread love to others and share love with others. The body of Christ and the blood of Christ, broken and poured for us, is a constant reminder of the immensity of love and it doesn't hurt. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we do thank you for gathering us at your table. We thank you for the lights of this congregation, like Clara and like Chalmers Co., who saw long ago the beauty and the bounty of celebrating your presence in this holy meal. We ask that you help us to be lights in our time, shining for Christ in this world. And may we always remember the goodness of his sacrifice for us and our giving ourselves to others. May we be like him as we give ourselves in love. We pray this in his name. Amen. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, when Jesus was at table with his disciples, he took bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper that night, he took the cup and poured it out and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the new and the everlasting covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts and upon each of us as we come to your table of grace to receive them now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Please join me in the post-communion prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. In preparing to depart, we as a faith community have heard the word and are called to respond and serve. There are many ways to serve our neighbors and this faith community. Here are some ways to serve and help during this time of pandemic. Watch your email, church website, and Facebook for updates concerning our faith community and how we will organize to help those in need during this time. Just a reminder, all worship will be online until further notice. No in-person worship. Please note also all the, the virtual studies and meetings being offered this week. Remember, we are in the midst of the 21-day challenge. It is sponsored by the Christian Ed and Justice and Mercy Commissions. Just a reminder, the 21-day Racial Equity Habit Building Challenge is where you do one action per day of your choice to further your understanding of power, privilege, supremacy, oppression, and equity. And we have extended this service all through the summer. We're including the 21-day Challenge on Prejudice and Rebellion and the 21-day challenge on self-care. And again, all of these challenges are all on the same website. We will host a Zoom meeting on specific Mondays for us to discuss what we have learned during this challenge in a safe place. There are two times to join in the conversation, 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. You will find the dates and the link in the Depart to Serve leaflet. If you need to be in touch with Reverend Ahrens or Reverend Corzine for emergency pastoral care or name a prayer request, please call 614-733-4547. This number is listed in the Depart to Serve leaflet. Just a reminder that your giving can be done through PayPal, Easy Tithe, or simply writing a check and placing it in the mail. No matter how you are giving, be sure to mark it for the mission of the week or to the regular church budget. If you have not done so, please like us on the First Church, First church Facebook page. There will be numerous postings through this time for engagement, activities, and devotion. So please continue to monitor your email, the church website, and Facebook page. We invite you to the virtual coffee hour after the service today. You will find the link in the Depart to Serve leaflet. Just click on the link and it will take you to the coffee hour. We also encourage you to check on your neighbor and ways you may be helpful to them. Let us sing the closing hymn as we depart with a heart to serve. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. of God. God be with you until we meet again. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.